welcome to the Good, the Bad and the Ugly podcast with me, Tony Morell, and this week's special guest is Vanessa Freak. Really looking forward to Vanessa sharing the Good, the Bad and the Ugly with us. How are we? I'm good, thanks, Tony. Many thanks for the invite. Delighted to be here and really looking forward to chatting with you. Thanks very much. Listen, me and Chris just want to say thank you for inviting us into your home. It's, uh, it's lovely uh, up here in Cambridge and... But uh, we're blown away by it, actually. I think it's, it's an old pub or whatever you were saying, but it's absolutely beautiful. So thank you very much for inviting us in. Uh, you're more than welcome. It's, it is an old house. It's about 450 years old, but um, it did used to be a pub and a pub of disrepute as well, called <laughs> The Axe and Saw. But um, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a lovely house, but it takes a lot of upkeep. <laughs> I bet it does. It's uh, it's beautiful, like I say. So, uh, listen, I just want to get straight into it and say, you know, I just want to start where you grew up, where you're from, school life, what family life was like. Oh, gosh. Um, well, if I can remember that far back now. Um, so, I uh, I was born in this country. Um, the first six months of this my life, I lived in Bedford, which is... Um, just the other the other side of uh, Luton up the uh, A6 um spent spent um 6 months here and then my mum and I flew out to the states um and I grew up for the next 10 years in the United States mainly in Denver Colorado and um in uh, LA um in about 1972 we came back to this country um and uh, my mum and dad got divorced uh, so my mum and I came back to this country. My mum's English, my dad's American. And um, I was sent to a Catholic school because my mum had promised in them days, you know, if you married a Catholic, you had to bring him up a, <laughs> a Catholic. And um, so my mum thought the best thing to do was to take me to a Catholic school. Sent me to a Catholic school, which she did. Um, I hated school, hated everything about school. Um, I got bullied at school. Um, I was always quite tall. For my age, but, you know, I weren't tall and burly. I was just tall and sort of weedy looking, and I think people sort of saw a vulnerability there. Um, so I didn't do very well at school. I think I came away with one ology, if that, and a couple of CSEs. Um, and re what I really wanted to do was go into the forces when I left school. Um, and I had um, an interview with the Navy, or the Wrens as it was then, um, on the 7th of the 7th, 77. <laughs> which um, I passed um, and um, was looking forward to starting in, in the Wrens. Um, and then I found out that I'd be shore based. That wouldn't be like... You wouldn't be out, in the, yeah. out on a boat I'd going around the world. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, which just like, you know, I was like, what? I go down like a lead balloon. Yeah, it just... just completely deflated me. Um, you know, nowadays things are different. And uh, maybe if I'd had my time again, maybe I would have done that. Um, again but um, so then I kind of thought well what do I do now and uh, I've always loved animals all animals um, and I thought well I'll go into agriculture and that's what I did um, went to Cannington College of Agriculture and Horticulture did a HND in agriculture um, flew through that passed it flying colours but that see that's me all over you know if I'm if I'm interested in something I'll give 110 you're all in yeah I'm all in Oh, it's, with me, it's all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. So if I'm interested in it, boom, I can, I can, I can punch it to, with the best. But if I'm not, you know, domestic science, needlework, you know, maths, <laughs> maths, I was absolutely <laughs> shite and still am now. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so you know, and that's what I did, and and then I um, I left college with an HND, a distinction. Um, and I started up my own relief milking business. So I used to go around different farms um, when. Farmers were on holiday, or their herdsmen were on holiday, and I and I really yeah. milked for them. And was that pretty? You know, was that a pretty busy for you? And yeah, so yeah. I mean, I was raking it in, and um, everything was hunky dory. You know, I was earning five hundred quid a week in nineteen eighty one. You know, it's a lot. I mean, today's yeah, money now. Until you look at in today's money, it was, it was serious money. And then, of course, as as always happens, the the bottom drops out of it. The the EU, as was then European Commission, bought in milk quotas, and they basically fined farmers for producing too much milk. So a lot of farmers just threw milk away, and of course, as they tighten their belts, well, it tightened my belt, didn't it? Right. And and uh, yeah. you know they decided not to take holidays. They decided, you know, um, that if their herdsmen went away, they'd step in. They wouldn't employ somebody to to milk the cows. 
And uh, it kind of fell out of it. And um, I, I kind of thought, well, what the bloody hell am I going to do now? So um, I happened to be up in London one, one weekend and um, just I was on the tube and there was a, a poster there, like like the General Kitchener poster, you know, with the old pointy hand. Well, and it's in the underground. Yeah, the yeah, on the, on the thing saying, you know, your prison service needs you um, and you too can make a difference. And I thought, mm, yeah, yeah, that That's sounds a bit like... Of me. Yeah, I could do that job. Cocky bugger. Yeah, yeah. It's, a good, it's a good skill to have though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I thought, well, yeah, I'll give that a go. But at the same time, I also um, quite fancied the Met Police. So I applied for the both of them at the same time. But when I was, I was, I, I was accepted um, in the prison service. It took about 12 months, but I still was waiting on um, Hendon. And um, by this time I was halfway through my training in the prison service and I got a letter from Hendon saying, oh, you can start in a month's time at Hendon College, police college. By which time I thought, well, I'm halfway through my prison service training here. I might as well just see where this goes. And that's it. So the ages, what was that? The age of 22 that you joined? 22, I was. Joined the prison service. Yeah. And, you know, obviously the age of 22, what was it? You know, can you remember what what prison was it? Holloway. Holloway. Or? I was I was recruited for Holloway. I was told on the interview, don't bother applying for any other jail. Holloway, are about eighty staff short. You'll be going straight there. So, what you did when you went um, up to the training school was you got um, like a first, second, and third choice. Yeah, like schools. Like, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said don't bother putting anywhere on it apart from Holloway because that's where you're going. So there we go. I mean, there, it, it was funny because like there were guys from the island. White who got Manchester and guys from Manchester who got the Isle of Wight, you know, it just, it just, it just, make... just didn't commute, but that, you know, that's red tape and public services all over, that. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I was Holloway recruited. Um, first day, rocked up at the gate, um, never been in a prison, um, you know, the, the most I've sort of had anything to do with the had you never been in a prison before just no, to go for a walk around no or? no um the most i'd had to do with like law enforcement was doing my cycling proficiency with the local bobby you know <laughs> <laughs> that that was about as, as far as you know i'd got um knew about anything so um I, I rocked up, um, said, oh, my name's Vanessa Frake. I'm due to start my training um, at Holloway. And <laughs> they turned to me and said, well, we ain't got you down. Sit over there. It's like, boom, <laughs> my bubble my bubble was completely deflated then. It was like, no welcoming arms. Oh, thank you very much. You know, we're so pleased Sleet to see away, it. just didn't feel. Yeah, it was like, oh, fine, okay. Anyways, there was nine of us on my course, all started at the same time. And they put us in these, um, like, you know, like Hilda Ogden. For those of you who remember Hilda Ogden, she had one of them nylon cleaning overalls that she used to <laughs> yeah. go around cleaning. Well, it was like that. It was navy blue. It was nylon. And, like, when you moved, the static and the electricity, <laughs> you could see it. It was like electric shocks going. And then they stuck a big sort of plastic sticker here, and it said NEPO, New Entrant Prison Officer. Um, Fresh stood out. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine, you know, you walk along a corridor full of like, I don't know, say 300 burly women who, who are used to prison and used to that. And nine of us sort of tiptoe through. You can imagine Abuse that. getting shot. Oh, them. like, you, you know, I think that was probably the first time that I thought, well, I'm going to have to make this like, like it don't bother me. Like, you know, call me whatever. It's, this is where it starts being yeah. tough, tough skinned and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. You know I mean? just and, like and just like it, it, you know, this is this is going to be your life now, and you you can't take a front every time sh somebody shouts "dyke" as you walk past. You know, <laughs> you just got to you just got to crack on with it. And um, that was my introduction to to the prison service. So from that your first day, and you know, from the nine that started with you, mm. did, the, did the nine see it out, or was there many that I just fell, fell um, from it? If some fell off the the end of it. Um, we, I think. I think there was, we've all retired now. I think pretty much we all retired round about the same the same point. So there were nine nine of us who looked at the prison service as a career, and you know that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be um, to have something that not particularly that I could 
you know, go through promotion with, but that I could I could use as my career. I could yeah. I didn't have to keep swapping and changing because I'm I'm quite um adverse to change. I like routine. Routine yeah, and yeah. I like to know what I'm doing, when I'm doing it and how I'm doing it. And uh, that's what I, I looked for. Yeah. So obviously your skills and you know when you first like landed at Holloway, like I say, you know, first twelve months and then did you think, you know, being a prison officer did you think you can move up the ladder? Was that, did that ever cross your mind? Of no, when I when I first joined, um, I joined in 12th of May, nineteen eighty six, and um, to take promotion, you had to do four years. So I wasn't actually ed- eligible for promotion till ninety one, um, and um, the only reason that I actually um, took promotion when I did, which was at my first opportunity, was because we had a senior officer who was crap. And I'd put, I'd had a real <laughs> row with her over a stupid just the way of running the just yeah. Running the and I thought, good God, surely I could do better than this. And and that's why I took promotion. And that yeah. that just started it off. And I was very happy as a I got my um, senior officers first time I took it flew, flew through it. Um, I was promoted in situ, so I stayed at Holloway. Yeah. Um, and um, I was I was a senior officer for eleven years. I liked that rank because you were. You were close enough to boots on the ground, so you still had a lot to do with prisoners, but also you were managing staff. So you would sort of had two hats. One hat was you were managing staff. The other, you were managing prisoners. Yeah. I mean, and I like that. That, that sort hands of, on. Yeah, hands on, busy, you know, still in the in the melee of things that, that went I'm, on. And with that, I would say, you know, you, I can see from like you know your work and stuff, what you, you know the ethic and stuff like that. You wanted to make a change because yeah. like you're saying you did. You did question that officer who was they were running it like you know when yeah. a lot of a lot of, you know prisons you know the staff were not coming for a lot of flack. You know what I mean? Because you know it's it's not for them or and the prisons the prisoners are running a mock so to speak. But for you, did you want to make a change in the prison system? I wanted. I wanted to. I don't necessarily say I wanted to make a change, but I wanted to. I wanted to make sure that that those in my charge were safe, that they were secure, that I was doing what I was supposed to do was keep prisoners in custody, that they got everything that they were entitled to, that um, you know the transition between um, leaving jail and and coming out was was as easy as it could be Prison for them. Life, so uh, civilian, life, yeah. Uh, so that you know that they had a home to go to, that they had you know a decent education if they were lacking in that. You know, something like eighty percent of prisoners can barely read or write. You know, th- what does that say about our society? You know, so so all these sorts of things. I wanted to make sure that. You know, people say about, oh, you know, lock them up, throw away the key. How can you speak to some of these people and the crimes that they've committed? And, you know, my my job was never to judge them. My job was to look after them and make sure that they were safe and that they were secure and and try and provide a role model to help them um, address their offending behaviour and prepare them for for release as, as a useful person in society. Yeah. That's how I saw it. And Holloway, so you, how long did you do at Holloway? I did, um, oh, let me think now, um, I did 16 years at Holloway and 11 years at Wilmot Scrubs. Scrubs but in between, yeah. in between those times, like, I did a year sort of on detached duty at the training school, yeah. um, teaching new recruits. I did... Um, Six months at Pentonville, looking after, helping them with their security um, stuff. I did um, six months at Wandsworth doing the same thing. So I, I have done other bits and bobs around the prison yeah, estate. Yeah, so you've but been around the prison estate. Yeah, 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 I've been around a you've bit, yeah. <laughs> well, like I say, you was a, as a prison officer and a governor, which we'll get to later on, you must have witnessed and dealt with some serious stuff inside prison. Can you recall... Any like major? Um, well, you know, no two days are the same in jail. I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you you might walk in thinking, you know, you've got this meeting to go to, you've got that meeting to attend, you've got to do these reports here, and then you know somebody commits suicide. Well, your whole your whole day is is thrown <laughs> out. You know, so you can't you can't. You know, I mean, I can remember the first suicide that I was involved in, and I can remember the last. 
and unfortunately the ones in between you know you stay, yeah, they, just... They're, they're just a blur and i think you know you become very sort of almost almost like blasé about about issues like assaults and fights and yeah, yeah. you know i've seen i've seen prisoners who've had sugared boiling water thrown over them and, and watch the skin just slowly just burn come off, just come off them you know, yeah just... you know i've seen i've seen uh, officers who've had um a couple of pool balls in a sock round the head or um we had one prisoner who had his head literally split from one side to the other with um you know one of those big batteries i don't know what what yeah. they call in a sock and it yeah. and it swung and just literally sliced him from one side of his head to his other to the other you know all sorts of things it's probably too many to to mention some of the self harms you know we had dreadful self harms at um, at Holloway not just like cutting but you know prisoners trying to take their eyeballs out prisoners sticking things in their eyes we had one prisoner who she used to um, stick a biro down into the vein in her in her leg and leave it, refuse treatment until it's almost gangrenous. Yes. And then come to us and say, All right, miss, I think it's about time I, I had treatment for this before she just like locked lost her leg, you know. Dreadful, dreadful things. Um that nobody prepares you for. Nobody that, how do you sort of you try and accommodate them things and you know to what you're seeing, seeing some people <laughs> taking their own lives and then you're trying to help people and then, you know, with the rest of the day or your rest of your shift. I just don't how prison officers and you know prison governors deal with that on a daily basis. Well, I think you know, I think if you spoke to most prison officers or prison staff, it's not just officers. You know, it's mm. nurses, doctors. You know, anybody who works in a jail. It's the same as you know the police or nurses or paramedics. You know, you see some dreadful things on a daily basis that most people don't see in a in a lifetime, and you have to learn how to compartmentalise those issues. Because it's all very well, you know, this might sound a bit heartless, but it's all very well. One prisoner commits suicide um, on a wing of, say, 344 prisoners, but you've still got 343 prisoners that you've got to look after. They've got to have exercise. They've got to have um, their meals served. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got to have, um, you know, go off to visits, et cetera, et cetera. So although you're concentrating on the aftermath of one prisoner committing mm. suicide, which in itself is bad enough, you've still got a, a regime of sorts to, to run with this the other 343. This is why people say about the prison service, you know, it's, it's, it's on, you know, it, it, they cut like down the, you know, the staffing and stuff like that. And how I, we had Sam Sandworth on, um, on one of our earlier episodes, he was a prison officer. And I couldn't believe what he, he, he said, like there could be five officers mm. to run, or maybe less to run a wing of a couple of hundred. Now yeah. to me, that's outnumbering the people who were in charge with keys and whatever. Now, you say one member of staff is dealing with a suicide or and then there's people wanting to, ah, oh, yeah, boss, yeah, miss, I want to go to mm -hmm. my, my visit, bye, bye, I want to go to, and it's irate, people want to go and have the gym, people want to go and have the food. That to deal with, you know, that's, that's pressure and stress upon the prison service, as you know. I mean, the, 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 the staffing is, is certainly an issue. And, and, you know, the way that since 2010, year on year, the, the government has slashed the spending in prisons. That's without a doubt. You know, they came up with this George Osborne, you know, more for less. Well, you know, that just doesn't cut it. Your staff are your most expensive um, product that you, that you have in a jail. And if you cut your staff, it's not just about you know, cutting boots on the ground, but it's about the regime. So it means you can't get out for for your association on an evening or your showers or your phone calls to your family or, or things like that because your most expensive asset, you're cutting. And, you know, it's five, six staff to look after 300, 400 prisoners. You know, we all know it's prisoners that run prisons. It's not staff yeah. because you rely on most prisoners – just want to get on with things, do the time, do the time, done the crime, do the time and get out and move on. Most prisoners, obviously you're going to get the ones here and there who, who are going to kick up shit here, there and everywhere. And you're, you're always going to get that, but you rely on prisoners managing a prison. 
it's strange as that may sound that is that is how it is basically that's how it is well if you've got six staff and you've got 300 prisoners let's face it you know it's not rocket science course, if, if yeah. they wanted to they could o o overcome the staff that's what like i'm saying that's that just easier but like you're saying there it's the prisoners the ones who want to the majority of them mm -hmm. want to just come do the time you know look no no shit along the way come in, do the time, and get out. But obviously you do have the unruly ones who... Yeah, of course and, that does, and it does happen where, un unfortunately, men, you know, prisoners take their own lives because they can't deal with prison or whatever. They have something go on in their life and they, they take that. And then it, within the prison, it just puts it not on a lockdown, but basically having to deal with that situation. And it has a domino effect, basically, isn't it? You know yeah, I mean? absolutely it does. And, and you know, it's it's... It's 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 very difficult to to be mindful when you're concentrating on somebody who's who's not only not only the p person who's who's committed suicide themselves, but also the staff that have found him, the prisoners. Mentally, it might be his cellmate that's found him. You know, you've got to make sure that all of those people who were actually involved. A duty in, of care, isn't it? Exactly. You've got a duty of care to them all, um, and um, and to say nothing about. Those prisoners that are on the wing who may already be on a, a suicide watch, watch yeah. you know, you've got to make sure that they're okay. So you've got all these different so things. So much going on. But, you know, adrenaline is a fabulous thing. And once yeah. it hits you, you know, you, you, you become super person. And, um, you know, the way to deal with it, everybody has their own way of dealing with it. Some... You know, better than others, isn't it? Well, yeah. You know, it's it's no secret that that alcohol played a big part in the prison service in the seventies, eighties, yeah. and early nineties. Um, and um, you know, relationships suffered, um, families breakdowns, exactly. Um, and and that's to be expected. You know, when you're dealing with such difficult issues on a daily basis, when you think you're going down that path and then it all kicks off and you end up sort of, you know, doing 14 hours, 16 hours because something's gone wrong. You know? And you, at the end of your shift, you're probably thinking, I'm going to have to wind down here. It's not going straight home and mm -hmm. with the kids and whatever. What have you yeah. witnessed that day, whether it had been a riot or whether it's kicked off or whether someone sucked their own life. Or, you know, you, you deal, and like you're saying, your shift doesn't end. Oh, by the way, I come in at six no. or seven and I finish at seven. It's like you say, a day, every day's not the same. It's, yeah. and do you think that's why they turn to drink and stuff? I think, I, I, absolutely, I do. And I think, um, you know, men in particular who are very good at hiding their emotions, you know, is, is and, you know, the, the prison service is always very much on bravado. So you have an incident, whatever that may be, and you say, well, you're all right. Yeah, fine. And you move off and you do the next well, thing. Really, they're not. And, and really, they're not. And, uh, you know, it has got better, but certainly sort of in when I first joined the job, you know, the, the aftercare for staff was non-existent. You know, I can remember um, my first assault... Um, I witnessed an assault. Actual fact: this woman went for my SO with a broom. Not the SO was crap because I'd have probably let her do it. But it was a different SO, and um, I jumped on this prisoner, got the broom off her, and obviously, like you have to write a statement. And my hand was shaking that much I could barely write. I'd only been in the job what probably two months, something like that. Yeah, just back and board. <laughs> yeah, and um, some some PO came up to me and said, "Oh, glad to see you shaking." Um, when you stop shaking, that's the time to leave the job. And I never, ever forgot that. She said, she said, that's the adrenaline. And as long as the adrenaline's plumping, you'll be fine. That was my aftercare after that <laughs> incident. <laughs> so, really? Yeah. yeah. Bloody hell. Yeah. That's crackers. You must, like I say, you've had some really horrific prisoners, the likes of Rose West. Mm. Uh, what was she like as an individual? And the reaction when you told her when Red obviously took his, uh, um, his own life? I often get asked about that. You know, the, the mainstream media bigs these people up to something they ain't. Yeah. They make them, you know, evil personified. Or um, if, if I say to you, Myra Hindley, you'll automatically think of the, the picture of the blonde bombshell, yeah. the, the staring the eyes. On the TV. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that's, that's what, but in actual fact, you know, when I met Myra, she was nothing like that. You know, I wouldn't have she looked like a bag lady walking down the street. Do you know what I mean? She was, she was nothing descript and Rose West was very much the same. You know, she used to, 
with Rose, it was it was always she'd do anything you asked. She was very compliant. Um, you know, she used to come out of a cell, we used to get her clean, and she couldn't be in the general population for with obvious the other, with the other for obvious reasons. Um, and uh, so we had her down in the, the segregation unit for three months before she went to Winchester Crown on trial. And um, part of my job, I was a senior officer down the seg at that time. And uh, part of my job was we had prisoners there that were, you know, they were there for their own protection. And Rose was one of those. Definitely someone would have tried to want to... Not, oh, yeah, she'd have been somebody's notch, wouldn't she? Of course, she, for without the, a doubt. to put on the board, sort of thing. And it was, and it, you know, it was important that, you know, we kept her safe. Um, you know, not only um, because that's what we were paid to do, but also, you know, you can imagine if um, it was bad enough that Fred topped himself um, at, at uh, Winsome Green, yeah. um, you know... I can't imagine being on duty then and being the senior officer in charge and, you know, the Fred West had topped himself. The the the, the vilification, most people say, oh, yeah, good, good riddance. Good riddance yeah. yeah. But the vilification on the prison itself. Because you've got to deal with all exactly. how he's done it and this, yeah. that and the other. And In, uh, the media completely. will just be all over you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Com completely. Um, so, you know... That was another reason to, you know, to keep her, her safe. And um, she was very quiet, very, um, did whatever you wanted her to do, come out, did some cleaning. Um, she she watched the TV quite a lot. She didn't talk much, um, but she did um, sort of make um, a friendship. We had a, a big Jamaican woman who was... Um, she was she was turning QE Queen's evidence against the big drug J Jamaican drug gang, and uh, she'd been issued with an Osman. And for anybody who don't know, an Osman is a, a police warning that says it's on your life. And yeah, all that. It's, and it's 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 serious shit if you get an Osman. You know, somebody is seriously someone's out to kill you. Yeah, it's simple yeah, that, yeah. And if you uh, want to kill you, don't. Yeah, exactly. So she was down the seg too on on um, protection sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, her own protection awaiting trial, and they became quite good friends. Interestingly, I don't, you just picked up on it. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah. And on on about sort of about six o'clock at night, we used to let them both out at the same time. They were no problem to the to the staff down there either of them, and they. We, they didn't have in-cell TVs then, so we had a big sort of a, a lounge communal, area. Communal one, yeah, yeah, and we used to let them sit in there and have a cup of tea, watch a bit of TV and that. And this went on for about, I'd say about eight weeks um, every night, pretty much. And they chatted, I don't really know what about, but um, Rose would be doing her knitting. And um, when Rose, then it came to the time that Rose had to go to Winchester for the start of her trial, she, um, the first um, day that she was, you saw her being taken from the prison van in the into yeah, the yeah. into the court, um, and uh, this this Jamaican girl saw it and said, "Oh, you know that Rose West, how dreadful she was, and you know she needs this, that, that, and the other." And, and myself and another officer we were like looking at each other, thinking, "What?" And we'd be like, "What are you on about? You've been sat next to her for the last <laughs> eight weeks, chatting away like she's your busy mate." And, um, she just didn't cotton on. She just didn't. She she could. She almost went white. She absolutely the colour drained from her. She had no idea that she was sat for the last eight weeks. She yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, making her a cup of tea. And but but Rose was very very good at like hiding emotion. You know when when um, the New Year's Day that we found out that that Fred had topped himself, um, the governor duty governor came down to the seg. And he told me, obviously, and he said, uh, I'm just going to go and tell Rose. And uh, you'd thought, you know, a tear would have fallen. Or yeah. Have been, no, nothing. No the, emotion whatsoever? No, not a thing. She said, thank you. Really? Um, uh, we was like, you're right, Rose. Um, yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. That was it. Nothing. But, but you know, people ask me, and I, and I always sort of think, did she think... By Fred topping himself, he's getting away with this. She was getting away. She was with convinced. It. Yeah, because I think that that's why Fred did it. Because he thought, I'll say, you know, I'll, you know, yeah, 
Well, the, the crimes that they did, you know what I mean? It was like... Oh, they were horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. You know, and, you know she completely um, deserves her whole life sentence. The blame game, like it's the, like them serial killers, you know, the, yeah. you know, the partnerships. It's like, you know, Fred West, Rose West, yeah, everyone, you know, from our era and stuff, was, you know, was growing up and remember seeing it on the TV. And, but it's a thing... If she did think that, which I think pretty much everyone thought, yeah. she genuinely thought she was going to get away yeah. with, like, obviously, all them crimes that were committed. Yeah, yeah, And Fred's obviously taking his own life. She was generally going to get the year later, go on. Yeah. The, 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 the I, mean, I mean, you could tell, I mean, typical sort of, like, you know, psychopath, no no emotion on, on any front, on anything, really. Yeah. Nothing at all. Uh, it, was, it was pretty much all one complete level right the way through. Yeah. So what was the story with Myra Hindley? Obviously, you, you had a little bit of a... Oh, check. <laughs> people, people ask me, but, you know, I, I was chatting to somebody quite innocently about it and um, somebody picked up on it and then, like, it sort of blew up into this, I work with Myra Hindley, but I didn't. Yeah, yeah. Um, when when back in the day, we we uh, we used... To, I'd only been in the job, I think, probably a year, maybe, maybe a bit more. Um, and uh, we used to take Holloway covered from Leicester right the way down to the Isle of Wight. So it was a vast, vast area. And um, once prisoners were convicted, we used to ship them out to various female prisons around the country. And this one day um, I'd been detailed to take, I think it was four, pr four prisoners from Holloway down to Cookham Wood, which is in Kent. And um, it was myself and two other officers and um, because I was the most junior, I got the, the pleasure of sitting at the back of a minibus that we used to call Pixies. I don't know why we called them Pixies, but they were the most uncomfortable things. And if you sat at the back, you felt every lump and bump going. And uh, so they shoved me down the back of the bus. We had the prisoners in the middle and then the, the IC of the escort, the in charge of the escort was at the, at the front and one was in the middle. And off we tootled out of Holloway Prison onto Cook and Wood. When we got to Cook and Wood, um, it's quite customary, you know, when you have staff from another jail coming in, you know, do you want a cup of tea? Um, and we all said, oh, yeah, that'd be grand. And um, as, as um, we um, were waiting for the orderly, um, we, we used to call them blue bands, then they changed to red bands, but they're supposedly trusted prisoners who who work in areas like reception and do Trying cleaning. To bring them and, back into society. Yeah, into well, like, yeah, sort of. But to, to learning give them a skills, job, really. job life skills. Yeah, and that stuff. sort of thing. And uh, this little old lady, like, potted along um, in this sort of um, denim sort of half-washed skirt, um, and she had uh, sort of like slippers on, but um, they were not sort of toe slippers they would just had you know you could see the toes through them and she had like tights on and she had this um like a old brown sort of cardigan where like the elbows warm, warm through you could see her shirt through the thing um she had mousy brown hair was sort of down to about here in in almost like um just sort of a straight cut and um, she said, what can I get you guys? And I said, oh, I'll have tea too, please. And the other officers that were with me said the same. And uh, off she toddled. And when she toddled off, the officer next to me says, you know who that is, don't you? And I was like, no. And they said, um, well, that's Myra. That's why. And I was like, well, Myra who? You know, it meant absolutely nothing to me. I didn't click at all. <laughs> Because like most people, you know, I thought of Myra Hindley as the blonde bombshell. This with picture that we all seen on the telly, yeah. Yeah, she barely looked at you, you know, she sort of shuffled along like that. Um, and um, I was like, oh, right. And then, um, you know, I always thought it was important, you know, with these sort of high profile prisoners that never give them the kudos you know, never oh, let you think, oh, oh yeah, never let, you, let, never let them see that, you know, you yeah. suddenly, it's like, fuck me. Sort of starstruck. Yeah. After, yeah. After so, what you've committed, so, yeah. So, so she came back, brought the tea back, and I said, cheers, thanks. And she says, is there anything else you, you need? And I was like, no, thanks, that's fine. It's like... Did it ever cross your mind she could have done anything to the tea? No. Or? Yeah, she, 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 people ask me that, but, you know... 
Why would she? Why would she jeopardize? What, what she was onto a cushy. I mean, she was another manipulative. You know, she manipulated a governor to take her out to Regent's Park to get an ice cream, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. yeah! Oh, absolutely. Her and Rose West had a had a little uh, relationship up in Durham Prison. Now, work the dynamics out of those two. To get from there to there, yeah. All about you know, it's just. It's, it, it, that's, you know, that's scary. That she, she is, she is, um, you know, she, she manipulated a, a, a prison officer called Pat Cairns into um, trying to help her to escape when she was at Holloway back in the old Holloway be before your yeah, well before my time. Um, and um, the, the plan was that Patricia was going to take a moulding of a key in soap and go and get a, a key cell key, key cut, um, and then get Myra out. And um, off they were going to go to um, Australia. To, um, they were going to run away together. Yeah, yeah. And off they were going to go to to Australia. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it sounds mind blowing. But you know, Someone, she had manipulated this woman into cunning, this, very cunning and very oh, without a doubt. But you see, you know, people people think you know she she played her part in those horrendous murders. You know, she manipulated kids to get into that car. It was her that got those kids into that and car. And then Brady. And then Brady, whatever. And, you know, there were things that were said um, in the trial that were never publicised because it was just horrific. too horrific for, I can imagine it, but just... for, for, for people to hear. And, um, you know, she deserved to die in prison. Of course she did, yeah. But, but again, you know, she tried to manipulate saying that she was going to help find Keith Bennett and that and... And they let her out on the moors in the 80s to try and find his body. And, she, you know, she suddenly um, acknowledged that she she helped with those murders and in, in a bid to to gain freedom. But I tell you now, there was never, ever going to be a Home Secretary that was going to sign that release document because that would have been his career finished. Most definitely. You get that, that's the horrific crimes that he did do, you know what uh, I mean? Completely. And I think, you know... People always sort of focus on Hindley, um, and I think that's because she's a woman, and women are seen as you know carers and nurturers and birthers of children. And I think that um, you know quite often it's it's beyond comprehension as to how a woman could do that to kids. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why a lot of the focus was on her. And, um, you know, she had this Lord Longford who tried and tried to get her out of jail saying, you know, what a changed person she was. And, and all he did was keep her in the public eye and keep her in there. Keep her relevant, really. Yeah. yeah. And really, she's, you know, she yeah. be 10 feet under if the truth be known. You know, exactly. people like that who do stuff like that to kids don't deserve to breathe. You know well, I mean? you know, I mean, I, they certainly don't deserve to... That's my opinion, do you yeah, know what I mean? That's no, good, I yeah. they, don't, they don't deserve to... to ever be released from jail like that of course you don't is it true it's, it costs 50 grand 50k a year to house a prisoner yeah just about yeah just about and um, you know that's my taxes and your taxes are paying for that absolutely and I would like we discussed before as well you know what just off camera you know serious crime and stuff like that you know obviously the law's the law and I get all that but when you're sending people to you know for, for you know, for silly crime, crime's crime, I get that. Okay, you get a criminal record and whatever in the commu community. When you're putting people in jail, like we said before, people's circumstances say there was a lady, I think you were speaking about, or somebody, and she was, she was shoplifting. Now, instead of going all the way to court and going all the way to jail for so long and housing a prisoner, that, that person's circumstances could be she's trying to feed a family, she's got no money. Money stopped with the government, I, whatever. Said she's lost the job, she lost the husband, anything. I don't think they have to, you know, they care for for prisoners. Or I just think it can be done better. That's just, I know, my opinion again. I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you, and and I think you know, there's a a lot of issues to cover there. You know, the first thing for me is that you know, locking somebody away for a first time non-violent crime. Yeah. You know, is ridiculous. Locking somebody away for anything less than 12 months is ridiculous. Like you said, you know, they do half of that, so they do six months. They come out. What have they got? They've lost their home. They've lost their job. They've 
could have lost their relationship, you know, but what have they had? They've had six months sitting with criminals learning how to do it properly, you know, so we let them out and think off they go again, because in six months you can't work with somebody. You can't address yeah. all those um, issues and behaviors that, that may have contributed to the yeah. crime happening, whether that be, you know, as I said, you know, 80% of prisoners can't read and write. So it's education. It's, you know, drug addiction. It's um, alcohol addiction. It's, um, you know, social housing, you know, There's so much, isn't there? Yeah, of course there is. And, and, you know, as a country here, you know, we lock a, we lock away more in Western Europe than any other country in Western Europe. We have the worst reoffending rates in Western Europe. You know, we we focus on locking people away. We don't focus on addressing offending behaviour. Um, and I think you know that is something that, to me, I bang on about. You know, you, you'll have seen. I it's it's a passion of mine because I think. You know, there's so much that we could do with these people in the community, but of course it needs investment. Of course, and, yeah. and, and unfortunately, to get investments. prison is not a vote winner. And, you know, all these political parties, doesn't matter which one you pick out, they all want to be the party of law and order. They all want to address crime and lock people away. They they don't they're not interested in in helping people to solve why they've committed the crime yeah. in the first place. You know, and I think it's it's a it's a very sad state of affairs for society as a whole. And I think you know, Norway did exactly what we did, but then they they saw the light and they suddenly decided, well, okay, we're going to re focus on reducing reoffending um, rather than focus on locking up. They now lock up a quarter of what we do. Yeah. They they have um, brilliant sort of um, offending behaviour programmes with um, drug addiction, um, alcohol rehabs, all these sorts of things, education. You know, when, when, uh, when I was at Scrubs, we used to go into schools and we used to do this um, prison me no way. And we used to talk to 15, 16 year olds about, you know, what can happen if you commit Awareness crime and, and, stuff, yeah. and what happens to you in jail. And, you know, what, the, you know, the overarching thing of, of losing your liberty yeah. and, and everything. Um, and, um, you know, they don't they don't seem to do do this to educate people on on, on going into schools. Happen. That's where they should start from. Absolutely. Let's, let's get them when they're young and they go falling into gangs and they're falling into the wrong way of look, you know, there's career options here and stuff like that. Yeah. I remember as a kid, the careers officer. Do you know what I mean? I, I don't know whether they still have them in schools and stuff now. And I think more should be done to, to start it from an early age because that's where it starts. Yeah. I, well, I had a careers officer. He told me that um, I'd be really good at working in the factory at Texas Instruments making calculators. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember mine. He said to me, I, I must be a footballer. He said, Tony, you won't be a footballer. Let me tell you, you won't be a footballer. I, don't even, I think he was, he was, he was right, but... <laughs> But like I say, Vanessa, I think it does need to be like going into schools and into colleges as well because they're yeah. young adults and stuff. And Absolutely. I, I, and maybe the government should look at that. But then again, it's funding again. It, 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 it seems it's, 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 it, these, the, this is why the crime rate in, in, in England, in the UK, is, is high, it's so high. And, and uh, this is why our prisons are full. Uh, and another thing I wanted to touch on, and whether you can you can touch on it, is the lenient sentences that sometimes the courts give out. And I'm going to touch on this particular, like sex offenders and and uh, and rapists, and you know I just don't understand sometimes with the sentencing. You know the oh a twelve month you know community order, uh, ten years on the sex offenders register. To me. You know, abusing a child, or uh, you know, historic sexual abuse, or or attacking somebody and sexually, you know, assaulting them. These crimes are horrific, and you know, you get people getting put in jail. Don't agree with people drug dealing and whatever. They're getting ten years when these crimes, what these are committing, these people live with these horrific it for the rest of their lives. The victims, the victims' families, a lot of people who were who were assault, sexually assaulted, a lot of people who were, you know, raped or whatever, who've been through a horrific experience, that will never ever go away. And some of the judges in the sentencing, I see it all the time in the news, but you see it on a daily basis. Two years suspended sentence, 
uh, and uh, you know, and, and 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 even people going to meet children online and grooming and stuff like that. I just don't get it. I just think to myself, why is it? Why is the system? He, these horrific crimes, and I'm only pinpointing that because it's something I'm very passionate about. No, do you know what I mean? I, I, I totally understand, and and I think that is a frustration for a lot of people. And this is what I say, you know, we're so focused on locking everybody away that we're putting everybody in the same pot, yeah. rather than pulling people out who are non-violent, non first-time offenders. Let them, you know, work, do some work in the community that they've offended against. Let's focus on these people who abuse children, rape predatory people who, yeah. who particularly go out and, and, and um, commit dreadful crimes against other people. But again, you see, like, much as I think the prison service needs a complete overhaul, yeah. I think the judiciary needs a, a complete o overhaul. You've got white old men um, focusing on telling other people what they can and can't do. Who, in my in my opinion, have no idea as to. Well, there was one the other day where a judge, um, a woman, had stabbed her partner. Um, and he didn't jail her because he thought that um, she was she was seven weeks pregnant by a different man um, and um, that she was pregnant. So he said, because you're pregnant, I'm not going to jail you. If you hadn't been pregnant, I would have jailed you. Well, you know, being pregnant isn't, isn't an illness. It's it's part of nature. And the prison service is really good at dealing with women People, who are pregnant who yeah, deserve to in be the in system, jail. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. But you know, so so to my mind, this this judge was completely out of touch with um, with prisons and what prisons can offer and what prisons can do. For what the crime she's committed? Exactly, and I think that in 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 a lot of cases, judges are out of touch. You know, they 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 are completely out of touch with Joe Public. How Joe Public thinks, how how it affects people. Um, the victims of crime, and I don't think that enough um, enough thought is taken about the victims. I don't think you know um, that enough victims have enough input into um, like all this crap about you know prisoners refusing to come up into the dock to, to be sentenced. Yeah. Let be being one of them. You know, I mean, that would never have happened when prison officers ran the courts. We'd have dragged them up, kicking and screaming, and have done so. This is all. This they seem to have more power, Vanessa. Yeah. I just think, hang on, you've you created, you've destroyed so many lives. It's like another. There was another. I can't remember who it was. There was another horrific crime committed. Um, I think some a young lady or a young life was taken, shot or whatever, and just just refused blatantly. Yeah. Hang on, look. You know, I think at the end of the day, this is a crime you've committed and. Seems to like prisoners have the authority to say, yeah. fuck you, I'm not doing that. And and I think like you've just said there, listen, <laughs> whether it takes two, three, four years, they yeah, drag exactly. them up to face the court, to face the family, to face the victim or Absolutely. whatever, because they deserve to see that. Do. do you know what I mean? And I just think it's outrageous that they've got, it's like they've got some pull. Do you yeah. know what I mean? That's my opinion. Do you know what I mean? I mean... <sighs> I think you know, particularly with the being in the dock. I'd never heard of it before. Before let be decided, she weren't going up into dock. Never heard of it. Never realised that it happened um, because certainly you know prison officers used to um, run the the docks, particularly the crown courts, um, and uh, now it's um, private sector securical, Sodexo, yes, Group well, Four, yeah, 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 all of those. Um, and um, you know, I can hand on heart saying you'd have never had and anybody yours. refusing um, to do that. That's crackers, isn't it? That's unbelievable. Another thing I want to get on contraband in prisons. You know, as a governor, something like you try yeah. and stamp out, and you know, there's a lot of prisoners who have spoke to say there's a lot of enforcers, there's a lot of bent prison officers within the system. Have you ever had to deal with officers when you were governor that were bent? Um, yeah. But I'd, 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 I'd just probably have to correct you then. I'd say I've dealt with prison staff that have been, um, because it's not just prison officers. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, yeah you really know, I've sorry. had nurses, I've had um, bringing mobiles, bringing SIM cards in, I've had um, solicitors. 
bringing drugs in. I've had bogus solicitors bringing drugs in. I've had um, <laughs> officers bringing drugs in. I've had education staff having um, bringing drugs in. You know, I've had the police allowing prisoners when they take them out on a production order to go see their missus, get get their leg over and bring drugs in. So, you know, <laughs> when when you say prison officers, you're... I mean, in, prison, yeah, in, in the system, I meant, sorry, yeah. There are, I there are, it better, yeah. you know, and and this is the thing, wherever you you have people in prison who want to deal with drugs, you're going to get drugs in. And as soon as... You know, you close one door, another one is going to open, without a doubt. Yeah. And as soon as you get rid of one drug dealer, another one slides so, straight into his shoes. You know, so it is a constant battle. People don't realise, you know, a lot of it is to do with technology and investments in prisons. You know, now we have drones. We have drones coming over the walls with little packages of drugs. You know, um, I've had dead pigeons fall at my feet, belly up sewn up with drugs i've had um <laughs> drug dogs going and finding a tennis ball which has been sewn up with drugs you know untold methods it's that thing again in vanessa dirty nappies what? um visitors coming in um to visit their boyfriend husband whatever with the kid with a dirty nappy on um with full, of full of drugs you know this is prisoners have have a lot of time on there and we had one um, a zip line that was from one of the fours landing on D-Wing, the Life Wing, on at uh, Wormwood Scrubs that went all the way over the wall, a 12-foot high wall, over the road, up to the top of Hammersmith Hospital, um, where they used to zip, zip line drugs down into this cell. And it was fishing wire. And unless the sun glinted it, you wouldn't see it. You it wouldn't would like totally reflected on it. Yeah. Sort of, and that's how the officer you found it. You're up against. Yeah, you know, and with staffing issues, what we spoke about earlier. Mm. How can you cut all that out? It might seem people might think, "Fucking hell, you need all you, you know." But if you haven't got the staff to, to, to well, to, you know, I think, you know, to my mind, you know, corruption prevention training has got to be key. You know, security awareness training, and that's for all staff, not just for prison officers. But and and, and it should be like um, the support needs to be there. You need to have um, a good intelligence system that staff can report matters. That you know that they are in no fear of reporting matters. Um, you know, intelligence if you get it. And, yeah, and so you know, prisons are full of intelligence. You know, and it's a matter of gathering that intelligence and and using it and. You know, people forget, you know, your mobile phone is your footprint. You know, we can tell where you've been to pick drugs up. We can tell who you phoned that you've you phoned a prisoner on a, on his mobile phone that we've just picked up. You know, the, the, people forget all these things that, you know, technology is, is so advanced now. It's, 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 it's not worth it. And uh, I used to say to my staff, you know, Prisoners have one thing that we don't have, and that's time. They have time to look for the vulnerable. They have time to plan, look, plan time to look at the chink in somebody's armour. If they're predatory on the outside, chances are they're going to be predatory on the inside. And, um, you know, prisoners, you may think this prisoner is in love with you. And, you know, it's all a fucking game. It's, isn't it? it's a game. And, you know, they want something out of it, whether that be you know their leg over or they want a mobile phone brought in or drugs brought in or they'll do anything to whiskey. get what they want of course they will um and um you know staff have got to be prepared for that i do think some of the recruitment side of things should be tightened up you know a lot of recruitment now is done online i sat face to face in front of three people and was grilled to within an inch of my life. Um, and that's how it, that, that procedure should be done. Isn't exactly. Because a lot of people that you speak to as well who, who've been in, in, in prison and stuff, a lot of staff come in and wet behind their ears and no disrespect mm. to anyone that's wanting to advance and stuff, but and they're just so vulnerable. Like you say, they get sucked in. Of course the, they the, the prisoners who have been in the system a couple of times or whatever, if they're wanting something, they're going to befriend them, like you say. Mm. They're going to, oh, you to make them... the the, dang, the, the golden danglies and all that and then the next thing corrupt, and that, they're and corrupted it, do you know what I mean once, once they've gone over that line you know once they've given that prisoner a fag or brought him a pack of fags in that's it you're done mate there's no getting away from it now because a prisoner's got you by the short and curlies and he ain't gonna let go 
and he's got you know that lever that anything that he wants you're going to do otherwise he's going to he's going to spill his guts yeah. you know he's he's yeah he's, this is this is the thing that you know that's why your systems need to be such that that you know the, the slightest thing you can go to somebody you can talk about it you can report it and yeah. things can be done about it so yeah i mean Corrupt staff, yeah, you know, as is at the moment, it's... It's, a, it's, a, it's Yeah, it goes on, but unfortunately... It goes on, but, you know, they have to be lucky every time. We only have to be lucky once. Yeah. Biggest regret as a governor or as a officer? Um, my biggest regret is probably, um, probably the armed escape that I was involved in. Um, we had a, a prisoner who, to cut a long story sh short... High we, profile... Um, he wasn't particularly high profile, but he was, uh, he was an armed robber and um, he was doing his second stretch for armed robbery um, and he feigned illness. Now, next to Wormwood Scrubs is Hammersmith Hospital, literally 500 yards next door to it. So when we had prisoners that needed to go out to hospital, they went to A&E at Hammersmith. And um, I was duty governor one, one, I think it was a Thursday and... Um, I got this uh, telephone call from the orderly officer who runs the jail. He was a PO and he said, um, Gov, the doctor's just called an ambulance. There's a, a guy called Faulkner on E-Wing. He says he's got to go out to hospital. The staff don't, don't think it's true. They think he's faking it. Um, what do you want me to do? So I said, well, I'll speak to the doctor. So I spoke to the doctor and uh, I said, look, the staff think he's faking it. And this doctor wasn't a regular. He was a locum. He didn't really know the prison. Um, and he was adamant that this prisoner was very Did he Ill. assess him or? Uh, yes, he'd been to see him. And um, he was adamant that this prisoner was ill and that he should go out to A&E. Now, we had some intelligence that stated that this prisoner could try and get out to hospital. We didn't know it was to escape. We thought it was to get drugs in. Um, and um, I said um, to the doctor, well, basically, we had a row about it. But at the end of the day, the doctor sees prisoners as patients. I see prisoners as prisoners. Um, and preser preservation of life is going to take over. Um, and um, so we agreed to send this guy out. But we called the local police, Hammersmith police, asked them to send a presence. They said they were too busy and couldn't but they'd send a car past. Um, I phoned Hammersmith Security. They said um, they would send some security officers down to um, the A&E department, which they did. Um, and I had three staff that um, were picked to take this guy out. Um, even when the ambulance rocked up, the ambulance thought he was faking. They just, everyone was on to him. Yeah. So we had to let him out, like I said, preservation of life and all that. Um, and um, 10 minutes later, I got a phone call from my communication room saying that um, the staff had been involved in an armed escape. Um, as they pulled into the A&E department in the ambulance, they'd been rammed up the rear by a car, out of jump two masked men with shotguns, um, threatened the staff, awesome. and they'd unclipped his handcuffs and off he'd gone. Um, obviously, you know, myself and my boss legged it round to Hammersmith Hospital, literally legged it, um, got there. The ambulance woman who jumped out when they'd hit the ambulance was in bits on the floor. My staff were completely in shock. But to be in face with Absolutely, shock. you know, absolutely. Um, and um, one of, to move on a bit, um, obviously, you know, he was caught, I think, about six or seven weeks later um, and moved to Belmarsh as a Cat A prisoner. He was um, nicked for escaping, which is a criminal offence, an armed escape at that. His accomplices were never caught, but he got another, I think, six years on top of his sentence. What he's ordered, you say. Yeah, yeah. and um, the staff concerned, well, the one of the members of staff never worked again. One who was an officer regraded to an Anbin grade and one killed himself. And that is my biggest regret. So there you go. The effect of like... Yeah. But nobody, you know, nobody knows what it's like to have a shotgun stuck in your face and you threaten. You don't know whether they're going to pull the trigger or not. No, nah, you don't know whether it's 
loaded the fear, it, unloaded. The fear that they must exactly. have felt, exactly, yeah. You know, and, um, you know, that that is my biggest regret, that, that I, I have racked my brains thinking, could I have done more to protect those staff? I can't think of anything, but, you know, you, I regret it every day. I, you know, I think maybe, obviously, because you were a, you know, governor and at the time or whatever at the time, and you are gonna put a bit of doubt on yourself, but you you know, you, you can't comprehend what's it gonna happen and um you can't help what's gonna happen. And you will dwell on things and think, ah, oh, but everything was done the correct way. Unfortunately to you know, mass men have jumped out with shotguns mm -hmm. and no one like you say, no one can how do you deal with that? You know, people can say, Oh, what well, listen until that happens. It's like anything in life. Yeah. Until something happens, whether it be someone jumping out on you and, and skistart and yeah, you, you know, you can react in, in a different way. But I, I know that's probably gonna live with you and it does hope yeah, it it, and it's it's And when people you know, I make no bones about it when people ask me that question, mm. you know, that is my biggest regret mm. because I feel and I will always feel that, you know, we let those staff down. And um, you know, that <laughs> There is nothing I can do about it. Yeah. I just, like you say, I have to live with that. And um, that will stay with me. Yeah. Um, do you believe in capital punishment for, in this country for certain prisoners? Oh, prisoners who we spoke about before. Yeah, okay. Pedophiles, rapists. If you'd asked me that question, Tony, probably 20 years ago, I'd have probably said, yeah, absolutely. And I'll do the death watch. Yeah. Um, I think as I've got older and as I've got, uh, not necessarily wiser, but I think you mellow a little bit. Mm. And I think there have been so many miscarriages of justice. Um, I think my, my, probably my thoughts would be, no, I don't. I don't, I, I'm not against jail. Lock them up, you know, keep them there, keep them, keep the public safe. Absolutely. Yeah. But I don't think that we're in a position as a society that we could ever go back to that now. Mm. Like America, you know, you see America. I know the yeah. America's a lot, <laughs> and a lot of people say this to me all the time, and a lot, we, we have discussions about it and stuff, where you have the electric chair, you have the lethal injection, the horrific crimes, well, you know. It doesn't stop them though, does it? They still come through. There's still so many. And I know America's a lot bigger than the UK. Yeah. And, you know, it's a massive, massive country, but... You know, I always think, and and who's to say? You know, your murder is more more important than your murder. You know, where do you where do you draw, draw the line? line? Yeah, I get that. Um, I, I I do I do understand. You know, the 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 likes of you know serial abusers, serial killers. Yeah, you know, yeah. absolutely, I totally get that. And mm. you know, the focus should always be always be on the victim, but. You know, would that give you closure? I don't know. I, I've never been in that position. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I couldn't hand on heart say, but, you know, I, I just don't see that it's the answer and I don't see that it would stop it. You know, there's some dreadful, horrendous crimes about. Um, but, you know, as a victim of crime, are you more a victim in one respect than you are in another re respect. I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's one for discussion and I'm mm. happy to have that discussion with everybody. But for me right now, this minute, I don't, I don't think say I don't agree with it. I just don't think that we should bring it back. Yeah. Um, one I, I want to touch on is Lucy Letby, um, is claiming insanity at the moment for her despicable crimes. She did. How does this work, Vanessa, after, you know, it's outrageous what she's, you know, how can she claim insanity for them horrific crimes? Um, I suppose the, the, what a psychologist would say to that would be, well, who in their right mind could do something like that? Um, but, you know, to my mind, this is, this is, um, and not necessarily a get out of jail clause. I mean, I imagine she'll do what Beverly Allett did, which was Beverly Allett's at Rampton now. Beverly Allett was the original angel of death. Um, I, I um, brought her into Holloway um, from the courts. Um, we um, kept her at Holloway. She was assessed as having Munchausen's disease. 
Um, and uh, she was very similar to Letby, to be honest. She was um, a nurse and um, she injected babies with insulin. She didn't kill as many as Lucy Letby. I think she was, I think she killed four or five, but attempted to murder another 12 or 13. Um, and she um, was transferred to Rampton. Um, and I think, do believe she's still there, Rampton or Broadmoor. Um, and there she will remain till till the day she dies. It is interesting, though, isn't it? You know, three of our most pro prolific serial killers have all been in the caring pr profession. You've got Letby, you've got Shipman, and you've got um, Beverly Allett. Um, and, um, you know, it's a form of defence. Um, you know, whether... She whether she will be deemed insane yeah. or not is is another matter. I'm sure to God the system will, you know, just see right through that and just say, look. I would imagine so. I mean, there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that, you know, it was all pre-planned and, you know, she yeah. took specific things home and, and tried to alter things. And, um, you know, psychiatrists, prison psychiatrists especially, are well adverse to... to prisoners trying to pull the wool so i would hope that you know whoever does do the assessment on her will it's interesting that she's now pleading insanity because for so long she was pleading not guilty and it was all no. a miscarriage of justice well, so you well, know me, which is it me and chris were speaking about this last night we were discussing this about because obviously i've seen it in the, in the in the news and i don't really watch much news but like that sticks out and chris was saying to me about it the mobile, she was like messaging and, and stuff, and to know the other staff members are like, uh, and I because I've not really followed the case, it was Chris who, who you know, sort of yeah. We were just speaking about it, you know, traveling yesterday and stuff, and I was like, no. And then it was one of the questions that I wanted to speak to you and ask, ask you what would yeah. your take be on, and I just find it like you've just hit it on the head there. Three, no, massive, you know, serial killers have been in that profession. Yeah. Is it the power that they've got because they're a, they're a doctor or they're a nurse? Injecting people, you know, it's like, yeah. it's... It almost makes you terrified to go to hospital, doesn't it? <laughs> and, uh, someone with a needle now would be like... Oh. No, I mean, and I'm, I mean, no disrespect <laughs> to anybody in the in NHS. Yeah. Because my mum was in the NHS for no. many, many years. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a... a like many people, uh, you know, great respect for our yeah, NHS. Course, yeah. But um, they do a fantastic job, by yeah, the way. Absolutely, yeah. they do. Um, but you know, you have to wonder: is it is it like firemen who set fire? And you know, is it is it a that sort of thing? Crime exactly. Or, you know, yeah, you yeah. have to you have to kind of wonder how, how that how that all works. But you know, that mm. is our society, I suppose. So, family life now for you, Vanessa. So, what, what? Um, family life. I have. Um, my wife, obviously, I've been married 10 years this year, um, but we've been together much longer than that, but we, we got married 10 years ago. Um, our daughter, who is 21, who um, works for Virgin Atlantic and flies around the world here, there and everywhere. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have four dogs, three cats and three fish. <laughs> so uh, I have a bit of a menagerie. My, my wife wouldn't let her... Let me buy a place in the country because she was worried that every time she fire. came home from work, there'd be a three legged donkey or, <laughs> you know, yeah, <laughs> something bit, like yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I love, I love my animals. Um, I, life is very good to me. I've been incredibly lucky to, you know, be where I am talking to you guys and, you know, publishing the book and it's done really is well. Is the book out now? Is it? Yeah, the book's out now. Plug, yeah? Okay, so it's called The Governor. It's um, on Amazon, Kindle, audio. Um, on the audio, I actually narrate it. So oh, right, okay. A lot of people have heard said it, it sounds like they're talking to me and to me that's a compliment, so, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you know, I found it very cathartic. I probably had a lot of things that I needed to put to bed and writing the book helped me do that. Um, you know, you said about, you know, how do you deal with all these things on a daily basis? Well, you've got to put them somewhere. And at some stage, you know, it, it, it comes out. It comes out. And, uh, and you know, that is a natural process. And uh, I won't lie. I found it. I found it difficult to, in, in part to, to go over some of the things. Um, but, um, you know, all in all, I found it good therapy, I think. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, like I said to you guys when you came in, you know, everywhere you go in this house, there's a there's a four legged friend that loves you. <laughs> so um, you know that they keep me very well grounded. I think so. Uh, 
that's brilliant. And just that just finish. What's in the pipeline for Vanessa Flea? Uh, what's in the pipeline? Well, um, it, there's a couple of things in the pipeline. I can't say too yeah, much yeah. about at the moment, but um, suffice to say, you'll probably be seeing a bit more of me in the near, in the not too distant future. Fingers crossed. That's brilliant, Vanessa. Me and Chris want to say thank you very much for uh, inviting us into your home and sharing the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's thank an absolute you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.